So is training to muscle failure just overrated? Do we even need to train all the way to muscle failure to stimulate the best results in terms of improvements in strength and muscle size? We're going to find out today. What's up guys, Jay Vincent here. In today's video, we're gonna talk about training to muscle failure and whether or not you even actually need to to stimulate optimal improvements in muscle size and muscle strength. But before I do that, go ahead, hit the like, subscribe, and the bell notification icon so you'll be notified when I drop more science-based training videos. So training to failure is quite a controversial topic in the bodybuilding community, and people have been arguing for decades on whether or not you even need to train to failure. Some recent literature shows that stopping with just a few reps in reserve actually stimulates similar improvements in muscle strength and size compared to training all the way to failure and enduring the huge amount of discomfort. So which is it? Do we need to train to failure or can we stop short and get the same results? What some people refer to as leaving reps in reserve. So first we need to understand the physiology of the motor unit. The motor unit consists of its neuron, its axon, and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. A single motor unit may innervate only a few fibers and can innervate as many as a several hundred muscle fibers. And a single muscle may only contain a few motor units or several hundred motor units. Now the smaller motor units are more easily recruited due to high excitability and they innervate fewer fibers than larger motor units. This is why the larger, higher threshold motor units can produce more contractile force. So when it comes to activities like walking or doing something very low intensity, your nervous system mainly recruits low threshold, smaller motor units because it doesn't need a heck of a lot of force to do these activities. But when it comes to things like lifting weights or doing explosive movements or movements which require a lot of speed or power, your nervous system is going to recruit higher threshold, larger motor units because they can produce more force and accommodate those activities. So that's the physiology and the concept of the motor unit. Now, how does your body recruit motor units and thereby recruit muscle fibers? Well, we need to understand something called the size principle. The size principle was first discovered by Denny Brown and Pennybacher way back in 1938 and later confirmed by Dr. Elwood Henneman in 1957 and coined the term the Henneman's size principle. So the size principle states that when the nervous system selects motor units for activities, it selects the smallest, more easily excitable motor units first, which produce the least amount of force, and then progresses to more powerful, larger, harder to excite motor units in order to maintain that level of force or increase the amount of force. So in a nutshell, the easier the activity, the lower intensity requirement, the smaller and the lower threshold motor unit recruited, and therefore the less muscle fibers are recruited. Then the higher the intensity, the higher the exertion, and the higher the intensity of effort, the larger motor units are recruited by your central nervous system, which innervate more muscle fibers and allow your muscles to produce more force. Higher intensity of effort, higher force requirements. So now that we understand the physiology of the motor unit and Henneman's size principle of motor unit recruitment, we need to re-examine what the goal of exercise actually is, and specifically the goal of strength training. So obviously the goal of strength training is to stimulate an adaptive response in our skeletal muscle. And we obviously want to stimulate this adaptive response in as many muscle fibers as possible. So that way we get the largest improvement in muscle strength and muscle size. Now Henneman's size principle states that we recruit the most amount of muscle with the highest intensity of effort because your nervous system selects the larger motor units when the intensity of effort or level of exertion is the highest. Now if we are taking a set of exercise all the way to muscle failure, we are getting to the point where your intensity of effort is the highest it can possibly be. When you get to the point of an exercise, when you are contracting against a resistance and the resistance cannot move and you are pushing as hard as you possibly can, that's the highest level of effort and intensity that you can possibly obtain in an exercise. Therefore, at this point, your central nervous system is recruiting the most amount of motor units, the highest threshold motor units, thereby the most amount of muscle fibers when you are training to failure. Now, can we get the same amount of motor unit recruitment stopping short of failure? Well, possibly, but how far short of failure? Is it three reps in reserve, five reps in reserve, two reps in reserve? We can't be certain. This is why it's a good idea to train all the way to failure, 
Because if you do, you can be certain that you recruited and stimulated as many muscle fibers as your nervous system can recruit. Now you need to keep in mind when you're training with super high levels of intensity, volume and frequency must be adjusted. And generally you need to reduce volume and frequency to accommodate high levels of intensity. But keep in mind the volume and the frequency are not part of the muscle fiber recruitment process intensity of effort is. So reducing intensity of effort to do more sets, more exercises, more reps is literally a step in the wrong direction when it comes to recruiting and stimulating your muscles. So it's clear that training to failure is not overrated, it is actually extremely underrated. Many people think it's overrated because they are continuing the same volume and the same frequency that they would with training not to failure and then incorporating training to failure. And this is going to lead to gross overtraining. And this is where people tend to start to think it might be overrated because they're experiencing symptoms of overtraining because they do not realize that you need to adjust the training volume and the frequency if you're gonna train very intensely which is not a bad thing because this makes your training way more efficient. Less time spent in the gym, less days traveling to the gym. So training to failure is extremely underrated. It's gonna save you a heck of a lot of time and it's going to ensure that you stimulate and recruit the most amount of motor units and muscle fibers your nervous system possibly can. If you wanna learn how to do this effectively and safely, join my VIP mentorship program. There's a link in the description to book a free 30 minute call with me to learn more about it. I will show you how to recruit as much much muscle as possible extremely safely so you can optimize your physique with just two 30 minute workouts a week. So click the link in that description if you're interested in transforming your physique, keeping that transformation and saving a huge amount of time doing it. So those are the facts on training to muscle failure. Can you get very similar results not training to failure? Yes, but it's going to take you two to three times as much time. And that's going to be two to three times as much wear and tear on your joints with more repetitions, more volume, more frequency. It just doesn't make any sense physiologically to not train to failure. Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, bell notification icon so you can be notified when I drop more science-based training videos. See you next time, guys.